Let's begin with a short overview of the forms. To explain Plato's theory of the forms, most textbooks use examples like that of a triangle. And the idea is that there are many triangular objects in the world, but they are all transitory and that they will eventually change form or be destroyed. But the concept of triangle as an object with three sides and 180 degrees is eternal because it would remain even if all particular triangles perished. When one understands this concept of triangle is itself real and the underlying cause of all particular triangles, that is, when one understands that the concept of triangle is more than a concept, then one is thinking about the form of triangle instead of the mere concept or definition of triangle. So the form of triangle is non-spatial and it's timeless, but it causes all the particular triangles that you see to exist. Now you cannot see or image or imagine the form of triangle you can only grasp it with your pure reason. For Plato, ultimate reality consists of these forms, all of which participate in the highest and most mysterious form, the form of the good. In short, Plato's theory of forms rests on the idea that a non-spatial, non-temporal order controls everything that we experience in this spatial and temporal order. These forms are the eternal truths that are the source of reality. So that is your overview of the forms. Now here's the problem. Many students struggle to understand Plato's theory of the forms because it depends on the strange idea that a non-spatial, non-temporal order controls everything that we experience in this spatial and temporal order. It just seems strange because all images of triangles presuppose the existence of space, but the form of triangle does not. But how can you have a triangle without space? And we just cannot see the forms either. So for these reasons, students dismiss the forms without fully understanding the arguments for them. So let's move to solutions. To help students take Plato's theory of the forms more seriously, it's useful to use recent developments in computer science and philosophy to outline modern reasons for believing in something like Plato's theory of the forms. So consider the computer program analogy. One charitable way to approach the theory of forms is to argue the forms are like the computer programming running a simulation. So the forms are the logic of the program. Let me age myself and use the Pac-Man video game as an example, though I know many of you youngsters are using slightly more advanced video games. So if I am Pac-Man, a ghost, or some other avatar in this video game, I will never see the programming, or the zeros and ones. I will never see the programming that causes my simulated reality. The program, the code, is a transcendent reality that controls this simulated world and is not observed by conscious avatars in that world. So let's imagine you and I are in the park and we are in a simulation, a video game, and we don't know it. Now experiencing the code for the tree that you see in front of you is not a sensory experience, but is instead a logical experience. And yet the tree is the code and it depends on the code to exist. Notice too that the tree is not eternal like the code, for it dies when you turn off the computer simulation while the code remains waiting to be activated or understood. And so the logic of the code is like Plato's forms, the logos of Heraclitus, or the word of God. The code is eternal because you can turn off the simulation, but the code, the logos, is always waiting to be activated. The code is higher because it causes a simulation and does not depend upon the simulation to exist. Finally, intelligent people grasp the code by reason instead of the senses. No matter where you look in the simulation, you will not be able to use your five senses to see the meaning logos program controlling this simulation. And so Pac-Man and other video game avatars are like prisoners in, in Plato's allegory of the cave. And if this world is a simulation, like the philosopher Nick Bostrom has recently argued, then you and I are prisoners in this simulation. And so my first and main point is simply this. Students will take Plato's forms more seriously if they can think of the forms as the computer programming running this simulation that you and I call reality. Now, this is not a perfect analogy, but close enough to motivate one to look more deeply into the various forms of realism, like Plato's theory of the forms. Okay, so let me add three points about how if we do live in such a simulation, what that tells us about the nature of science, the nature of scientific laws, and mysticism. Okay, the first point is that science and empirical observation cannot access ultimate reality if we live in a simulation. If I am in a simulation, I cannot assume my world is anything like the logic of the program. Science cannot help me because science is the process of observing, hypothesizing, and testing. But I can only scientifically observe dots, ghosts, and Pac-Man. With science, I describe what happens when Pac-Man sits still. You know, the ghosts eat him. 
and what happens to the dots when they move in various directions. Right? I generalize from these patterns and make predictions, but science and math are only tools for describing what happens in the simulation, what happens in the parameters set by the unobservable program. So in short, science helps me control the simulation in some ways and live better in it, but it cannot, in principle, give me access to any worlds outside the simulation. If there is a transcendent world, there can be no scientific proof of it. So the lack of scientific evidence is not evidence that the transcendent does not exist. The lack of scientific evidence is actually what is to be expected if we live in a simulation or if platonic forms exist. And notice that this is not really a criticism of science any more than it's a criticism of a hammer to say it's not a flashlight or a screwdriver. Everything has limits. Okay, here's the second point. The computer program, like Plato's forms, is not simply an empirical generalization from our experiences. For example, most people think of the scientific law of gravity as Newton's generalization from how apples and other observable objects behave. But the computer program and Plato's forms govern and cause the simulation. They are not simply generalizations from it. Nor is the form of triangle merely what all triangles have in common you know, three sides, 180 degrees, since the form of triangle, the program, is real but beyond the space and time of the simulation. That is, the form for triangle is not a triangle in space and time. The form of triangle is the meaning, something like the meaning or the set of directions to create triangles. You could say the form is more real than the many triangles in this world since it causes them to exist. And so the fundamental point is that scientific laws are like computer codes, and they are not simply empirical generalizations, they are causes. Finally, notice that psychonauts believe we need something like DMT to escape the program. Mystics in all traditions have similar answers that are not based on ingesting DMT. And so these people believe there's a higher reality, but that it must be known in some mysterious way. It cannot be known through the senses, science, or reason. And perhaps there is something to this. Consider that your current consciousness cannot be a mere simulation because there is no doubt that you are having an experience right now. You can doubt that my voice exists, but you cannot doubt that you seem to be experiencing my voice right now. So whatever ultimate reality is, it is flowing through you as consciousness right now. It seems to follow then that one way it may be possible to access the transcendent world, if such exists, is to close your eyes and look inward. Doing so may lift you from your two-dimensional flatland into a three-dimensional world that transcends the program and makes no sense to those of us embedded in the program. So to conclude, the arguments of Socrates and Plato survive today because there is something more to them than meets the eye. Those two guys were smarter than most of us, and it's worth exploring their ideas in more depth. And so reality is stranger and more mysterious than any idea anyone has about it, and so are you. Okay, thank you for listening to my nonsense.